neighbor, uh, who's a wildlife rehabilitator. John's also on. John's also on the board. Oh, yeah, now it's uh, oh, now I can hear me too. <laughs> John's also on the board of Protect Our Wildlife Vermont, um, which is how I was directed to him. I've been a member for a number of years, and I'm really happy with their work. There's a little bit of information right here about the um, bill that's in the process of being discussed. Um, I'll be talking about that. Oh, and he'll be talking about yeah. that, so that's great. Um, I could go on and on about that, but I'm not going to. We're, we're going to talk about beavers plus that John's going to be talking about. Um, first, John's name is not Albert, as is in the program. It's Abirth, and that was totally my fault. I, I apologize to right. everybody. Um, John, I'm going to read this now. John's a retired professor of medieval history, has taught at various colleges and universities, both full and part-time for 20 years, between 1991 and 2011. He taught part-time at UVM and full-time at Norwich University and the University of Nebraska. It's quite a distance. Yeah, that was a big commute. Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, he drives a school bus part-time and is a volunteer licensed wild, wildlife rehabilitator specializing in raptors such as hawks, owls, falcons, and some mammals such as beaver, bobcat, coyote, mink, and weasel, <coughs> which is what brings, us, brings him here to us today. John. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Allison. Uh, very nice to see you all here today. Um, yeah, we have a um, uh, facility at Roxbury, Vermont, which is about half an hour south of here. Uh, at Fl called Flint Brook Wildlife Refuge. Um, I got my training at BINS, or Vermont Institute of Natural Science for Raptors, and uh, I took an avian rehab course, and then I did an apprenticeship with the head wildlife keeper there. Uh, but I also do some mammals, uh, including beaver, bobcat, coyote, uh, mink, and weasel. Uh, so I, I do some mammals and beaver are one of them. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, my rehabbing of uh, one orphan beaver for two years. And then he was paired with the, another orphan beaver for the second year. And then I released them um, this past May, in May of 2021. No, sorry, May of 2022. Uh, I got them. Um, you know, the first beaver kit on May 10th of 2020, uh, about the same time as we were locking down for the coronavirus pandemic. So I had plenty of time to, uh, my wife and I, to rehab this, uh, this beaver. So I'm going to be talking about that for the most part. I have some video and, and, and pictures, and I'd like to thank my wife, who is the photographer, and, and she took all these pictures and video that I'll be showing you. Um, and towards the end of my talk, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about the main threat, or the main mortality threat to beaver, which is trapping. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. Anyway, uh, people come up, many people will come up to me and say, hey, John, why do you do beavers? Well, beavers are perhaps one of the most important animals on our landscape, because when you save a beaver, you save a lot of other wildlife. Beavers are called a keystone species because when they dam streams and create ponds and wetlands, these create habitat for uh, so many other animals, waterfowl, fish, moose, deer, mink, amphibians. You know, you could go on and on. They uh, create habitat for other animals. So if you want habitat, for, for animals, you want beavers because they, they create some of the richest habitat on Earth. They have been compared to rainforest and coral reefs in terms of the biodiversity they, they, they support. So um, beavers are, are you know, a key species. Um, I could go through a lot of benefits of beavers. You know, they create diverse, diverse habitats. They, uh, you know, increased biodiversity. They have been used to promote trout recovery. 
uh, regulate stream flows. They create catchment areas so that um, you know you can prevent flooding um, when there's heavy rainfalls. They improve water quality. That's because they create deeper water. And when you have deeper water, a lot of the sediment will settle down into the bottom part of that pond, and that'll purify the the water. They replenish aquifer, aquifers, and uh, stabilize the water table, uh, repair stream channels, restore watersheds, um, and um, they, they reduce the risk of flooding, and they store carbon and help mitigate climate change. So a lot of benefits to beavers in, in creating their wetlands. They've been in the news lately. This is from a New York Times article in September of 2022, um, you know, a rancher used to blow up or dynamite beaver dams. Now he's, he's cherishing these beavers on his landscape because they, they help store water and uh, prevent drought or, you know, um, they help, uh, uh, you know, protect against climate change. This is from the Los Angeles Times of the, you know, same day, September 2022. Beavers have been called the superhero fighting climate change. They've actually produced maps uh, showing where wildfire, wildfires have torn through areas. And there's always, a, you know, the green areas are where the beavers have created their, 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 um, their watersheds or their, um, uh, you know, wet wetlands. Uh, that's green. The rest is scorched by the wildfires, so beavers act as a break on wildfires and, um, you know, uh, also uh, protect against droughts by, you know, creating these, these aquifers. Um, now, beavers are perhaps the most difficult animal to rehab of all the animals um, that rehabbers do. Uh, what, there are a few reasons uh, why this is so. One of the reasons is that when you take in a beaver, you're taking in that animal for two years. So it's a two-year process. You know, when I take in a mink or a bobcat, even a coyote, uh, you may rehab them for a few weeks or a few months. But then you release them in the fall, which is when they normally go off uh, on their own and leave the, the family unit. That's not the case with beavers. Beavers, beaver kits stay with their parents for two years. So that's how long you're stuck with this animal for, for two years. So that's a very long process. Um, you know, beavers are also very family oriented. They're, they're unlike other animals. You know, if I get a bobcat, uh, I'll put it in the enclosure and I won't really have much to do with it. You know, it'll be on its own. Beavers need attention. They need that, that contact with another family member. Uh, we say in rehab, you have to provide food, you have to provide safety, you have to provide warmth. But with beavers, you need a fourth thing. You need companionship. And beaver kits have actually been known to die from neglect, from just being left alone. Uh, this was told to me by beaver lady. I call her beaver lady, but as a woman who has 30 years experience, rehabbing beavers in New York, and she was a great resource while I was rehabbing uh, my beaver uh, that I got, that I first got in May of 2020. So um, first thing is like, when you get a beaver kit, there's no telling what the sex is. You can't tell the sex of a beaver from the outside. All its, uh, all its sexual organs are inside the body. The only way to determine the sex is to x-ray it. So this is an x-ray of our, the first beaver we got, BK. Call him BK, he's, you know, that's uh, short for beaver kit. But how do we know he's a male? He was a male, and that's because of the os penis or the bone in the penis that shows up on the x-ray. You can see it here. You can also see it right here. Uh, so that's the only way you can sex these animals. It's very important to do so because if you're trying to pair up beavers, beavers are very territorial. If you try to pair up two males, they're gonna fight each other for territory the whole time, and that, that has happened.
um, but if you pair up a male and a female, uh, they will become very inseparable companions. They mate for life, and they'll form a, um, a stable unit that you can then release, and they'll stay where in the release site where you release them. Uh, so that was one of the challenges. Um, so this was, uh, I, I never named the, uh, the animals I get in. Uh, one of the reasons I do that is because, um, you know, my goal is to release them back into the wild. I don't want to get too attached to these animals. These animals are not pets. These animals belong to everybody. They belong to you and me. They're, they're, a, they're you know, part of, um, you know, the natural resource and uh, the common, um, you know, uh, ownership, common property of all the monitors, like the uh, air and the trees. So I never named them. I, just, I simply called him BK. That was short for Beaver Kit. But anyway, he was only a week old. When he came to me, he was just one and a half pounds. And, um, you know, uh, we had... Well, yeah, that's a story in and of, of itself, but uh, he was found on the rail trail in St. Albans. Um, there was a, a beaver pond on one side and a, a beaver lodge or a house on the other side. And this was, you know, on either side of the rail trail was private land. And the farmer wanted to get rid of that, that pond because it was, you know, flooding his, his, his agricultural land. So he took out the dam on one side and then he crushed the lodge on the other side. Oh. So he took out, you know, the safe space for beavers is their pond. They first, you know, escape into water. And then he took out the lodge, which is their second refuge. So he was the only survivor of, um, of this incident. So this massacre, you might want to call it, uh, which is very unfortunate. But he was just found wandering the trail. And he was picked up by a man and brought to me all the way from St. Albans. So, um, you know, we had to figure out how to feed him. And um, another interesting thing about beavers is they only go to the bathroom in water. So, you, you know, they, they're not going to uh, make a mess of your house. But we, you know, he had to live in the bathtub because he needed water. It was May, it's still cold in Vermont. He couldn't be outside. Uh, so, um, you know, he had to live there for a month or two, um, and then we had to feed him every day. Uh, so anyway, uh, there was, uh, you know, I had to spend time with him. Uh, you know, he would spend time with me as I was working on my computer. The, you know, you have an you know, inside look of our bathroom here. <laughs> Outside, you know, he might snuggle up to the crook of my arm. Um, this is him sleeping in the crook of my elbow. You know, it's awfully cute. Uh, but, you know, he, you have to spend time with him because, you know, they're, they're, they're part of a close-knit family unit. And they form these close bonds with the members of the family. And when the family is gone, you have to take that place. But the only bond with, you know, the single uh, member of the human family with my wife and I uh, if they encountered any other humans, he would hiss. they make a sss, sort of like Darth Vader. And he would, um, he would not uh, accept any other humans. So it didn't mean I couldn't release him. He didn't get so attached that I couldn't release him two years later. But you do have to spend some time with them. And, um, you know, we, we would feed him a special formula. Uh, using a miracle nipple, which is a, a nipple that goes onto a syringe, and then you can regulate how much milk formula to give them. Um, this is the formula. It's a very special formula. These are, this is made by a company called Fox Valley, which supplies zoos. And um, it's 30% protein, 50% fat. So a lot of high fat, high fat content to this milk formula. Um, he also learned, uh, you know, he was swimming from day one. So he would swim in our bathtub on the upper left. And then in a, we also had a pool outside. He would swim out there. And then when he was in the enclosure, he was able to get in and out on his own uh, through a ramp 
going into the, the pool. Uh, he also went through various um, uh, lodges or houses. First was this plastic tub that was used as a filing, uh, used for filing papers. And, and he lived in there for the first few weeks of his life. Then he began chewing on this. So we, I had to make a wooden one. Uh, so he, you know, it wouldn't matter if he chewed on the wood. Then when he got bigger, he lived in this dog loo, which is, you know, for dogs, but it's big enough. It sort of looks like a lodge and was, uh, you know, useful in the outdoor enclosure. Oh, uh, I include this because, you know, it's too cute, you know. <laughs> this is, uh, beavers are said to be smiling, but this is the natural confirmation of their, their face. But uh, here's him, you know, uh, you know, walking through the grass. Um, here he is showing off his incisors as he's scratching himself underneath his chin. Uh, there's another picture of their incisors. Uh, you know, are usually orange colored and they grow throughout the uh, length of their lives. Uh, they're always wearing them down through their chewing. Um, here's him yawning. <laughs> A good view of his, his mouth there as well. I include this picture because, you know, it's an awe picture. You know, he has his paw on my hand. It's like, you know, reaching out across the species divide. Um, beavers have a tail, uh, which is very distinctive. It sort of looks like a snake skin. It has scales on it. What is the function of the tail? Well, that's, you know, up for debate. It's never used for building dams, like in the Bugs Bunny cartoons you may have seen. Um, <laughs> they, they, they don't use the tail to scoop out mud. The tail is used as a kind of rudder and kind of, um, Blast in their swimming, and it's also used to slap the water if they're if they're alarmed and they warn each other that way. Um, beavers also have uh, these impressive hind feet, which you can see in the upper part of the slide. They have web feet. There's this sort of skin membrane in between their toes, and it's very effective. It's like flipper feet. They you know they're very impressive swimmers. They're really designed to spend their lives in water. They're an aquatic animal. Um, they also have a nictating membrane. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but it's, it's right here. It's a membrane that comes over the eye and turns it blue. And uh, that's sort of like goggles. Uh, when they're swimming, it protects the eye when they're in the water. Birds have this membrane too, like woodpeckers, for example, have that membrane when they're pecking and it will protect that eye. Uh, they also close their ears. Their ears have a valve that sort of shuts the ear, uh, as you can see on the top. And on the bottom, when he's dry, it's open. So uh, I'm just going to, that's uh, very impressive. All these adaptations um, allow beavers to uh, spend a lot of their lives in water. Uh, so we also would, would take him for walks on, on the lawn at this time in the first three months of his life. Um, he would dry out pretty quickly. He looks like a drowned rat on the upper right. And then he poofs out uh, when, you know, it took about five, ten minutes. Uh, he also had a beaver buddy to keep him company. Uh, he would play with his beaver buddy and sleep with that beaver buddy. Um, and they got along pretty well. <laughs> uh, we also, at this time, even at a young age, we took him to the stream. Um, you know, it, it's sort of, I would, although he's part of the rodent family, beavers are part of the rodent family, he had many of the characteristics of a dog. He would follow me down to the stream, and um, he went right to the stream. He wouldn't wander off anywhere else. And he would stay in this cove in the stream and swim around. You know, this was to get him adapted to a natural environment, get him used to that. And he would practice chewing sticks and building dams and doing the things that beavers will do in the wild. So that was good experience for him. So this is um, one of my videos here, one of many I'll show actually, 
But this is a, a short video show, showing him, uh, you know, at about a couple weeks old, swimming in the pool. And you can see how he uses his tail in order to change direction in the water. So he's also using his feet, which are well adapted to swimming. And uh, his tail seems to give him stability in the water. Um, and then, he, you know, we put a rock in there so we'd have something to climb onto. This is another one. This will show him doing a 360 in the water, uh, turning himself around 360 degrees. I think this is actually the one we just saw. No? Yeah, I think you showed it again. <laughs> Maybe I'll... Uh, Go to the next slide, sorry. This is a, this is a, another one where he's, um, you know, he turns, turns himself around 360 degrees. <laughs> so he has a good time there. Do they make what? Do they make no, noises? They, they do make noises. I don't know if there's sound here. I can try to put the sound on. But yeah, they, they do. Um, they make an ah, ah, kind of almost like the cry of a baby. Um, but yeah, he, you know, they, they do make uh, that kind of noise when they want something. Or, um, you know, that's a pretty friendly noise. When he uh, wants you to go away, or warn you off, he'll hiss. Um, but yeah, they, they make various sounds. This is uh, uh, one of us grooming him. Uh, this, you know, we're using a flea comb. But he also, beavers groom themselves quite a bit, uh, especially when they come out of the water uh, and they're drying off. He'll, he'll groom himself, scratch himself, that kind of thing. Yes, I'll, I'll show that too. <laughs> Let me see. Okay, go, to, go on to the next one here. Um, th this is uh, showing him, you know, coming to us. You can pat the ground, for example, and I'll come, you know, come to you, and then I'll go off, and then I'll come back to you when you pat the ground or, you know, make a, a noise on the ground. Beavers have terrible eyesight. Uh, they can't see five feet in front of them. Their best sense is their sense of smell. Uh, they also have pretty decent hearing, uh, but um, <laughs> they, they can't see very well. So anyway, let me fast forward to the next one. This is uh, one of us feeding him with a syringe. Um, you know, he, uh, he'll, he'll suck up this milk formula, and he, he got so well at it that I didn't have to push the plunger at all. He would just suck up it on his own, and, um, you know, this next one will show it even better. Um, you know, the plunger would go up all, all on its own as he was sucking the formula up through the, uh, uh, up through the nipple. So, uh, you know, we would feed him, uh, you know, three or four times a day. Uh, he would drink, uh, you know, initially about, you know, eight ounces or a cup. And then it got, got up to two cups, three cups, four cups a day. Uh, so he went through a lot of formula in the end. Uh, this is just him uh, showing up in the bathtub. He was in the bathtub for a while. <laughs> and uh, this is also of him in our, in our bathtub. So he was in here, um, I would say, until July. And then we were able to put him out in, in an enclosure outside. This is him playing with his beaver buddy in the bathtub. He's, uh, you know, he's a little bigger now. Um, I would say he's close to three months. Um, you know, he's, he's done well on that milk formula, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but, and he's, uh, you know, he'll, you know, he would play with this beaver buddy. Um, you know, they need some kind of companionship. This is him grooming himself on the top of his head, using one of his hind feet. You can see the hind feet are a lot bigger than their paws, and uh, they're very impressive. 
um, in terms of their ability to, to propel them in the water. Um, so, you, you know, you get the idea of that. Uh, this is him in um, the pool outside with some foliage. Um, there was a frog living in here for a while with him, so that was interesting. <laughs> but you get the idea there. Uh, this is him in our stream that's only like, um, you know, I think 50 or 100 feet behind our house. It's right behind our house. So it's very convenient. I could just walk him to the stream, and then he could be in a natural environment. And he would uh, collect sticks and pile those sticks and, you know, use those sticks to dam the water. So this is all good practice for being a beaver out in the wild. So he's, you know, he's doing that. You get the idea there. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, um, you know, I would say that was for like two months okay. until mid-July. Mm -hmm. And then he was weaned off that. He was simply eating solid food, which is basically willow or poplar. Those are the two main favorites, trees that they like to eat, willow or poplar, uh, you know, or, you know, quaking aspen. Mostly just the bark, right? Uh, they also like the buds. That's, uh, you know, a favorite thing, the poplar buds, for example. He really loved those. He would eat, like the, eat that like popcorn. Uh, they'll also eat, um, you know, they, they'll eat in the wild, they'll eat uh, aquatic plants in the ponds. Um, we would give him uh, a special treat of an apple or a carrot. He loved those. He didn't like celery, though. <laughs> didn't like that. <laughs> but uh, we also fed him uh, a specially formulated rodent chow, I call it. It's uh, nuggets that are especially formulated for people who have, you know, pet rats. But they have all the vitamins and minerals they would need. Um, they would get out in the wild, too. So we'd eat a lot of those. So anyway, the, the next phase, you know, three to four months, he's getting up to 15 pounds, so he's getting pretty big. And he was ready to go out into the enclosure. Uh, and we would take him down to the stream every day. Uh, kind of like walking your dog. You know, you walk your dog, uh, but in this case, you're swimming your beaver. And uh, that's what we'd do. He would, um, you know, he had his dog glue house. He had his pool. Um, he uh, had sticks that he could chew on. Sometimes he would chew on my shoelaces, uh, you know, which, um, you know, was a problem. Uh, Beavers also love to wrestle. Uh, that's one of their main activities being shown here, where he's wrestling me holding a towel. And, um, you know, if they are part of a, a beaver kit family, the beaver kits will wrestle each other or push against each other. They're pushing, pushing. It's sort of like miniature sumo wrestlers. Um, uh, I, I think maybe this develops their upper strength or their, their, their muscles to be able to push over trees when they've chewed through trees and can push them over. But um, that was one of the favorite activities, and you see that on the video. Uh, so anyway, this video is of me walking him down to the stream. So, you know, he would follow me down, and beavers normally create a path down to water. So he was very attracted to water, and he would naturally go to that. Um, you know, he wouldn't go anywhere else except in the direction of the stream. <coughs> so this is of him going down into the water. He's stopping along the way to chew on a fern. But um, you get the idea. What about his sleeping habits? Do they take naps and how long do they sleep for when they go to bed? Beavers are usually crepuscular, so they're usually most active at dawn and dusk. Um, uh, so he was, his typical pattern was that he would sleep until about 11 or 12 o'clock until about midday. Then he would get up and then he would play with us or swim in his, in his pool. And, uh, you know, then he would, uh, you know, chew on bark and, um, you know, eat some nuggets and, uh, you know, he usually go to bed maybe around um, after dusk, 
But then sometimes he got up in the early morning and he would make these noises uh, and we'd have to go down and, and be with him at two or three in the morning. So, um, you know, he, he had these rhythms, but it, it didn't always accord with human rhythms. <laughs> but uh, this is of him, him chewing some sticks in the stream. Um, so you, you sort of get the idea. He's having a good old time here. And this is all good natural environment where he's, uh, you know, in this natural cove of the stream behind our house. Would he willingly leave that or would you have to carry him back? I, I usually have to pick him up and carry him back. <laughs> um, you know, we usually spend an hour or so and then, you know, okay, it's time to come back. We might entice him out with a nugget, uh, but then, you know, He's very slippery when he's wet, so it was hard to pick him up. But, you know, we could still pick him up at this stage. When he got up to, like, 40 pounds, that was harder. Beavers can get up to, like, 60 pounds, 70 pounds. He got up to 50 pounds when I released him. So I wasn't really picking him up at that stage, Eddie Boar. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, he, I'd have to carry him back, usually. Yeah. No. Well, he, once he was in the water, he might. He might want to go upstream and explore. Uh, beavers will travel, but they always travel on the stream bed because that's a safe space. He wouldn't wander off over land. They might go, you know, maybe 50 feet from water uh, as they're trying to get food. But, you know, water is their safe space, so they don't stray far from that. So if he explored, he would sometimes go upstream, and we'd have to, you know, follow him and bring him back. But yeah, that was that was the only direction that he would wander off in. So anyway, you get this idea. Um, you know, he's he's having a good time um, in this in this stream, uh, exploring its uh, flora and fauna. Um, so. Uh, The hearing is pretty good, but their sense of smell is the best sense. Okay. So he would smell me, and if I was off in any way, like if I had washed my hands or something, he might be suspicious. <laughs> but um, you know, they 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 they're like dogs in that sense. Their sense of smell is the best sense. And this is of me wrestling with him with a towel. I guess we don't have any sound. A little bit. Uh, but anyway, uh, and uh, this is more beaver rustle here. Um, so this is one of his favorite activities. Um, you know, this is part of, you know, playtime. Um, so, you know, you have to have this interaction. Otherwise, they don't develop very well. And um, this is me trying to bring them back. But you can see the nuggets that are there. Uh, those are specially formulated nuggets that we would feed them as well. Uh, so by the autumn of 2020, it was up to 20 pounds. Um, you know, the water is getting colder, so it was harder to pick them up out of the water. But, you know, I like these shots that Laura took. You know, it's very artistic, the leaves uh, on his body. Um, <clears throat> and this video is, uh, again, of me uh, getting him to walk down to the stream. He's living in his, in his, in his enclosure still, uh, so I had to try to uh, persuade him to. He can usually clamber out of that, but um, I had to pick him up here. Did he ever bite you? No. No, he, um, you know, it's a very much of a trust issue. I could, put my, I could put my finger right in his mouth, and he wouldn't bite down at all. Uh, when we scratched him, he would nibble back. He would like give you little love nibbles, but it felt like um, you know a little little pinches. But um, you know, no, he never uh, bit me. But in the wild, uh, a bite from a beaver can be quite serious. Um, so, but yeah, it's 
you know, you just trust him, and um, you know, you were part of his family, so uh, he never he never offered to bite. Uh, but anyway, um, this is another video of walking down to the stream. <coughs> this is a a video of him, you know, moving sticks in the water, and Laura's able to get some close-up shots. Well, yeah, in a sense. Um, he also was a lot of trial and error, too. But, you know, he's basically moving these sticks to dam this part of the stream where the water is flowing. They're attracted to flowing water, to the sound of flowing water. <coughs> and um, they'll try to stop that flow. You know, so that's instinctual. They will try to stop water flowing. Um, and that's how they build their dams. Right. Yeah, I mean that—that that is the trigger for them. Uh, you know, it triggers their damming instinct, um, which is why when you have a a culvert going under a road, that's a natural, um, you know, uh, trigger for a beaver to dam that because that water flow will trigger their damming instinct. Um, so you know, this is more video of him swimming. Um, here you'll see him, you know, come right up to the camera carrying his stick, which, you know, he's, he's carrying to a certain location he wants the dam. And uh, this is of him uh, going into the water. This is a, this is a great little clip uh, Laura was able to take of him underwater. Uh, this camera was was able to uh, was waterproof and was able to you know take a video of him underneath the water as well sort of like Jacques Cousteau kind of <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> but uh, yeah I think this is pretty nice uh, but anyway so you know they're very well adapted for being in the water like this yeah Yeah, yeah, he had a reddish brown fur. Okay. Uh, the other beaver I got, who you'll see, had dark brown fur, so they do have distinctive qualities, distinct, distinctive markings uh, to them. When you paired them up with someone else, another beaver, did they take to each other right away? Um, it took, you know, the normal protocol is to separate them, get them used to each other. Uh, but I'll talk about that in a minute when I saw pictures of that, but uh, it took about two weeks uh, for them to sniff each other out, and then they got together, and they were inseparable after that. So yeah, this is pretty, pretty good shots of him underwater, another shot of his face in the camera, uh, in the face of the camera. Uh, anyway, yeah, this is of him, uh, you know, going upstream, pretty strong water flow here, but they're, they're good swimmers. So he was able to, you know, swim against the current. Using his hind legs like this. This is a nice shot of him swimming underwater. Beavers can hold their breath for 15 minutes. Uh, so they can stay underwater for 15 minutes. That's pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, this is another water shot. So um, in the uh, you know winter spring, um, you know he got up to 38 pounds. He was a year old, and we were also able to pair him with another beaver, a female beaver, during this time. I think this is a, a nice shot of him with his teddy bear. Uh, you know how cute is that? That's pretty cute. <laughs> but uh, you know he's he's all snuggled in there. So. In this, especially in this first year, 
Uh, we kept them in an indoor facility, and it's important to do that because, um, you know, they're, they're without their family, they're on their own, and they, they don't have um, sources of other bodily heat. So they're, I've known other rehabbers who've kept their beavers outside, and they've died in the lodge, uh, fr frozen to death, um, or getting sick from pneumonia. Um, you know, so you, you have to really keep them inside for the first year because they don't have their family around them. You know, uh, normally the temperature, they've measured the temperature inside a beaver lodge, it's about 70 degrees. Um, but, you know, without the uh, additional family members, it can be very risky to keep them outside, especially in their first year. You had a nice pool. This is a, um, you know, normally a feed tub for horses, but this is like, six feet long, uh, three or four feet wide. So he could get some good swimming in here. Um, and um, he had his sticks and he, he also had, in the upper right, he had a smaller, um, a smaller pool. Uh, he would typically often go to the bathroom in the smaller pool and use the other one for swimming. Sort of like, um, you know, um, litter box training for a dog. Uh, Pretty impressive, and uh, you know he would—he uh, was getting too big for my lap. You know, part of him could fit in my lap, but this is me grooming him, and he'll give me—he would give me little love nibbles with his teeth, not, never biting down hard. But he did chew holes in my jeans, and uh, <laughs> that, that got annoying. This is just the video of him, um, you know, grooming himself. But anyway, uh, the, the main event that happened was at a year old, uh, he got a companion, Mrs. Beaver, I, we called her, who um, was orphaned at a, as a yearling and came to us from another location. And uh, um, she was mated with, with our uh, BK. She was uh, smaller, about 23 pounds. And um, you know, as I said, it took two weeks for them to get together. Uh, we had them separated with a uh, railing. Uh, they had two separate enclosures. And um, that was okay for about two weeks. And then one morning I came down to find them lying together like that. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, you know, is she dead? And then I saw a hind foot come up and saw her scratching her belly. And I knew she was fine. And they were, they were inseparable after that. And the amazing thing is somehow they had got, she had gotten through that railing uh, into his side of the enclosure. And I've never really figured out how they did that. <laughs> kind of scary, but um, I think somehow they lifted the railing up and she scooted underneath. And uh, you know, they, were, they would sleep together, they would play beaver wrestle together. Um, and so, you know, that's him on the left. You can sort of see a reddish tinge to his fur, and that's her on the right. She had more brownish fur. Uh, so they spent all their time together, and uh, these beavers mate for life. Um, this is just of her. She sort of had these bug eyes. She had these prominent eyes, which was uh, one way you can tell them apart, for example. And this is her. She would, she would sleep flat out with her mouth open like that. She sort of looked like she was almost dead, but beavers will often lie flat out and they'll make themselves into a kind of rug. They'll look like a beaver rug. They can flatten their bodies when they relax like that. Uh, so this is a video of them, um, you know, swimming together in the large tank. So, uh, yeah, they had this ramp going uh, up and then into the tank, and then eventually he lets her in, and they, they swim around together. But we were filling up the tank at this point. That's why the hose is in there. It took about an hour to change the water. We had to change the water every day. We had to drain all the water out, clean out all the poo inside the, inside the tank, and then fill it with fresh water. And we did that every day. So that was, uh, that was a chore that I don't miss. 
<laughs> but anyway, so, um, you know, they could both swim in this tank, and you see them do rolls. They would roll in the water. They, they were sort of like otters. They were pretty playful in the water like that. Um, this is a... Sorry, let me go back here. The water temperature was just, um, you know, it came from our hot water tank, but it would be, um, you know, a room temperature, you know. Uh, the water, uh, uh, you know, the water is inside their beaver lodge too, and that will never freeze because the beaver lodge is about 70 degrees. So they can always have access into the water and under the ice, but yeah. Is that like spring water or what, what type? Of no, the water came from our well. Oh, okay, but it's well water. Yeah. They need that type of water. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, you can't keep them outside for a number of logistical reasons. One of them is that the water freezes in a pool, would freeze in a pool outside. Um, so they wouldn't have access to water. They need water every day because, you know, when they go to the bathroom in water and they drink a lot of water. Um, but yeah, that was, that was our water source. Yeah. Did, did you need a permit to have a wild animal like this? Oh, yes. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not like anyone can do this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I should, should have said this at the beginning, but I have a license from the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife to rehab animals. And I also have a permit from the US Fish and Wildlife uh, Service to rehab birds. You need that for birds because birds are migratory, they cross state lines. So you need a federal permit. If you're doing birds, you need a state permit only if you're doing only mammals, which some rehabbers do. But if you want to do birds, you, have, you need both a, a state and a federal permit. And there's a whole process that's involved. They come out and inspect your enclosures. There's an exam. You know, you have to answer over 40 questions and so on. So yeah, it is quite a process. And once you're done with that, what do you have? So you've got a, what do they call the uh, permit degree or? Well, it's a, it's a rehab rehabilitator permit. And, uh, you know, they issue it every year. And, you know, it's just uh, a piece of paper says that you're authorized. And do they come out and uh, inspect you? Yes, they, they periodically will do that too. And will they tell you when they're coming? Um, <laughs> not always. <laughs> and, and uh, I've had them simply show up. And do but, you do that for other locations for the Wildlife Service? Do you visit other? Uh, are you an inspector? I'm not an inspector. I'm not, I'm not associated with the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife in any other capacity. Okay. Yeah, they just issue the permit. I also have to report all the animals I take in every month. And I have to um, send those reports to them. To where? Uh, to, uh, there's a, a, a special officer dedicated to, um, you know, dealing with all the rehabbers in Vermont. There's about... 16 of us and uh, I send my reports to her and then uh, you know she communicates back to me but uh, I, I have to send it in an excel spreadsheet every year every month now yeah. uh, I have to report on a yearly basis to US Fish and Wildlife every year I have to send them a report too but, yeah Uh, not usually, no. No, I mean, uh, that's more the case with the uh, rabies vector species, they're called. That's raccoons, foxes, skunks. There, they usually like you to release them in certain locations. But with uh, any, any other birds or, or mammals, um, you know, you can release them in what's called a soft release, where you simply open the door of the enclosure and they go off. I've done that, or a hard release is when you put them in a the carrier, take them to a certain location, and then release them. With birds, for example, with raptors, we like to release them in their home territory. 
So yeah, with him, I released them in a special location, which I'll show you. Um, that was, you know, uh, obviously because they need water. Uh, so it had to be a, a location that was suitable. Yeah. Are you allowed to have other pets, like cats or dogs? Uh, sure, why not? Okay. Yeah, I have to keep them separate, of yeah. course. Yeah, we, we, we run a horse farm, so we have uh, a dozen horses, um, but they're separate. And you, you know. have to worry about other animals coming in and killing them, like other wild animals? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'll show you the enclosure I built just for them that, you know, it had... It had uh, chain link mesh underneath and on top. So nothing could get in or out. Yeah. Uh, do you have any funding or any way? Um, this is all volunteer. Um, we do accept donations, but uh, we can't ask for any money when we uh, take in animals. I mean, typically, I'll have someone call me. All the rehabbers are listed on the Vermont De Department of Fish and Wildlife website. And uh, people say, I have, you know, I found this beaver, and I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll meet you here, and uh, the, we'll do the transfer. But, um, you know, I, 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 ne I never, I'm not allowed, and I never would um, ask for any money. But sometimes people give money uh, as a donation, and I'm allowed to accept that if it's voluntarily, yeah. I'm astounded by the commitment this takes. Do you have a personal life? <laughs> yeah, I'm retired, as I said. Yeah. Um, you know, I retired from teaching. So, yeah, I mean, also this is during the coronavirus pandemic. Mm -hmm. So even with bus driving, we were furloughed in March when the um, governor declared a state of emergency, and there was nothing else to do. <laughs> so uh, why not raise a couple beavers in your basement? <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, I mean... That's not normally you would do, but it is a big commitment. It's yeah. a, a lot of commitment and training. Um, you know, I said I trained at Vins. That was nearly a year-long process. And, um, you know, you, it's a lot of investment of time and also of money because you have to build the enclosures. It's kind of like a catch-22. You can't get a license until you've built the enclosures for those animals. Does Laura need training, too? Um, well, she's trained, she tra you can be sub permutee under me. She, tra she trained under me, so yeah, that's allowed. But um, otherwise, you know, you have to get a, a license. Um, and, um, you know, each rehabber needs a separate license. But yeah, I have a separate, I have an enclosure for raptors, and I have an enclosure for the mammals, and they're separate. Yeah, and they're separate from all the other animals that are on our farm. But yeah, this is, um, this, this is, of, uh, I think, BK carrying a stick. He's trying to carry this stick into the tank. But yeah, it's just impressive how they can, uh, how strong they are. They can, um, you know, this is of him trying to carry this stick out of the tank. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> sort of having a hard time with that. But yeah, they got pretty used to that ramp. They would, they would never fell off that ramp. But um, this is a, an interesting video. This is of, of them wrestling each other. Uh, when he got his mate, he no longer wrestled with us. He could wrestle another beaver, and that was a lot of fun for him. But she's on the left, and he's on the right, and guess who's winning? It's, it's she always won these these wrestle matches, and um, maybe that's an an allegory for humans. I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that. But uh, she she always won those matches. She was stronger than he was. So, so uh, that was very impressive. Uh, you know, she was pretty strong, and. Um, uh, that's possible. <laughs> he, he was a chivalrous beaver, maybe, but, uh, you know, eventually they get tired, and one would run off, and that was the end of the match. Do they have eyelids and blink? Do they have what? Eyelids. Do they have eyelids? They don't. I mean, so 
No, they have that nictating membrane I mentioned, but normally, otherwise, they don't have an eyelid. Um, yeah, but their, their sight is not very good. But, you know, they have a nictating membrane. It, it, their eyes look sort of blue when it comes across when they're in the water like that. How long does the female carry a baby, and how many babies does she have in a lifetime? <clears throat> they're, um, they, they usually, uh, you know, they might mate in, uh, in the middle of winter, like December or January, and then they'll give birth. Um, you know, usually around April. Um, it's, you know, designed so that they're giving birth in the spring when there's water. And um, they might have, you know, three to four kits uh, at most. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, eventually one will run off, and that was the end of that. <laughs> but, and this is, this is of them wrestling in the water itself. So they also wrestled. <laughs> on the on the floor, but they also wrestled in the water as well, and they uh, you know they could get quite uh, quite rambunctious in the water like that. Um, but they're very good swimmers, so that was okay. And then you'll see him chase her out of the uh, off the ramp. He says, you know, I want to I want to get out now, so um, you know get a move on. So they usually. Um, you know, they immediately groom themselves when they're out of the water. <laughs> so, you know, he says, you know, get a move on. Um, you know, I want to get out. So uh, they both get out. So um, um, I'll just finish up here on the, the rehab part. Um, so this outdoor enclosure I built in the summer of 2021, and as you can see, there's chain link on the top of this enclosure, yeah. and there's chain link on the bottom. Yeah. So nothing can get in, nothing can get out. And it's half in the water, half in the stream, behind our house, half on the land. So they could, um, you know, they love this. They could, they could get access to the water whenever they wanted. Um, you know, they, uh, they would swim together, eat together. Uh, this is a video of them in this enclosure. Swimming around in the water part, at least. And he, he would try to dam the, da the uh, downstream side of this enclosure. So he would get some sticks and pile them on that side. And it made the water deeper, actually. So that's that. Um, this, uh, you know, just is a video that shows the a good shot of the enclosure, and then, you know, is, Laura is, comes into the enclosure, and you can't see the beavers. The reason you can't see the beavers when you come into the enclosure like this is is because they're underwater, so it's hard to see them. Uh, so they were often hide when someone came into the enclosure. So the water was their safe space. Uh, their refuge, if you will. What's the, white, what's the white dome? That was their, their lodge or their house. That's the dog loo um, where they would sleep. But you can't see the beavers uh, at first because they don't know who's there. So they hid. Um, and then this, uh, this then, sh then shows them swimming around in the water. And you get the idea here. And this shows them, uh, you know, coming up onto land when they realize it's a friend and they, they uh, come up and, and ask for nuggets or something. Um, you know, this is uh, of her eating some nuggets out of her dish. Um, you know, they, they love these. But you get the idea. They can, you know, they can uh, grab things pretty well with their forepaws. Uh, we, we built this pond, uh, a little pond, uh, which will be the new enclosure for them instead of that, the one I showed you uh, in the previous slide. So finally, we released these two guys on May 20th of 2022. 
Um, I won't disclose the location except to say that it's as it part of the New England Wilderness Trust, or NEWT, and uh, it's protected against trapping. There's no trapping allowed. And uh, this is a, an existing beaver pond, but there are no beavers there for a number of years, no evidence of activity for years. I already had a dam, which you can see on the left. Um, and I think there may have been a lodge somewhere, although I never found it. But to release them, we made them a temporary lodge, which you can see is a plywood box, basically, three feet square with a covered ramp going out of the box directly into the water. So they could always be safe um, from predators because they would go directly into the water and then come out of the water into their lodge. Uh, so we built this special uh, release house for them. Uh, we set up a trail camera to capture these pictures. This is of him swimming in the new, new pond. He was very happy with it. Um, this is a, a video of them swimming together in their, their new home, their new release site. If I can uh, get this to go. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, I, I would have to release them in Vermont. You can't take these animals out of state. So. Uh, yeah, I guess that's not working. Anyway, we checked up on them four days later, uh, and they were doing quite well. Uh, and he was already wild. At that point, when he came up to me, he hissed at me, like, get out of my territory. This is my territory. This is my home now. Get away. So uh, they wilded it up pretty fast, uh, which was nice. This is what you want to see. Uh, about a month later, June 20th, 2022, Beaver uh, release house looks like this. Uh, obviously, they found a new home, built a new lodge, and this was falling apart. So um, uh, that was good to see. It captured a moose. Um, <laughs> trail camera captured a moose. So this is why, you know, uh, beaver wetlands are so important. They provide uh, homes and food for other animals. Um, and this is another picture of the moose checking out the uh, abandoned beaver uh, release house, I guess. And finally, um, you know, it's completely disintegrated. And we came to remove the house on July 5th. Um, and that was the last time I saw him. Uh, both he uh, and she came, came up to us and uh, checked us out as we were, you know, dismantling this release house and taking it away. No, he didn't, didn't hiss at me, but uh, we kept our distance. Um, but yeah, I got a new beaver <laughs> almost right after I released these guys. Um, but it's sort of a sad story. This, this uh, beaver kid's parents were trapped, um, you know, out of season by a private landowner. And um, uh, it was trapped as a newborn, I think. The beaver is only one and a quarter pounds, which is their weight when they're born. And um, the, uh, the beaver uh, died about a month and a half later. Uh, and there was really nothing I could do. It was, it was eating formula, drinking formula rather. But um, the vet did an autopsy and thinks that it never got colostrum from the mother. Um, and therefore, it was never able to have a, a good metabolism could never really digest the milk that I gave it. And it just simply stopped growing. It stopped um, growing and um, became thinner and thinner. And then uh, I watched it as, you know, I watched it one day in my bathroom. It died from uh, death throes. Uh, it simply uh, wasn't able to uh, metabolize any food and didn't survive. So I'll just end by uh, talking a little bit about trapping of beavers. Beavers are the second most trapped animal in Vermont. Um, uh, and uh, they're, they're trapped for a couple of reasons. One of them is you know, because people want their fur, which historically is the reason why beavers almost went extinct. <clears throat> uh, because in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, they used their fur to make hats and so forth. Um, the other reason is because they are so-called a nuisance, and they flood um, roads, or um, you know, uh, they flood or they flood roads or other areas 
when they dam culverts. So let me talk about both for a second. This is a Vermont Fur Bearer newsletter issued by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, this is, you know, for the trapping community. Um, you know, Vermont, uh, the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife promotes trapping as an activity. Uh, and it says in this newsletter, their instructions to trappers are, post tasteful photos with as little blood and animal suffering as possible. We know animals in best management practice traps suffer very little. But many people don't realize that. That's an outright lie. And I'll prove it. I'll show you why. Uh, animals suffer horribly in these traps, even if they're the best traps available. They suffer terribly. When I put an animal, a wild animal, into an enclosure, it's, even in an enclosure, it's stressed out because it's contained. It can't move freely. Uh, the, the best thing you can do is provide a place for it to hide, like a hollow log or you know, a piece of culvert pipe for them to go into hide. Imagine in a leg hole trap, the animal is, is uh, restrained for hours on end. Trappers only have to check the traps every 24 hours. So they can spend hours in this trap uh, and exposed to the elements, to predation. There's nowhere else for them to go. They can't hide. Uh, you know, that's, that's horrible suffering for an animal. And that's very different from hunting. I have no problems with hunting. You know, hunters make a path to people that bring me animals. And I grew up in a hunting community. I don't hunt myself, but I understand hunting. But trapping's not hunting. No. Trapping is not clean kill. It's not fair chase. These animals are suffering for hours. And the leg hole trap is not even trying to kill it. Uh, so I have a, lot, a big problem with that, quite frankly, because animals shouldn't suffer uh, if you're killing them. I have to kill animals every year. I kill dozens of animals that can't be released back into the wild. But there are only certain ways I can, I can euthanize an animal by you know, fish and wildlife regulations. I can use a CO2 chamber, which is how I euthanize birds. Uh, it's very quick and painless. Uh, you can give them an injection, which uh, you know, is usually how you euthanize uh, mammals at the vet. I, have, I work with vets, and I have a vet do that. Uh, you can also shoot the animal. Uh, but you, we, as rehabbers, are not allowed to drown animals. We're not allowed to club them. We're not allowed to strangle them. And we certainly can't keep them uh, tied up until we're ready to kill them. Trappers can do all that. Uh, what about the law that they're trying to, I mean, it's, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, okay. yeah. Yeah, I have that, the flyer on the table about that. But yeah, that is, um, there is a law in the legislature that would um, ban recreational trapping. I still allow, you know, nuisance trapping or trapping to protect infrastructure. Towns can still trap uh, if they feel they need to do so. Farmers and landowners are still allowed to trap if the animal is caught in, in, do, in the act of doing actual damage to the farm. Um, so this, this is just a listing from the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife newsletter showing all the animals trapped. There's 13 species. Uh, beaver, about 1,400 beavers are trapped every year. Altogether, about a little over 10,000 uh, are trapped. So thousands of these animals are trapped every year. For what purpose? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Why are trappers trapping animals? Does anyone buy their fur? Not anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know who has the most fur? In Vermont, it's me. I have whole racks of fur coats downstairs. Why? Because people donate to me their fur coats. They don't want them anymore. And I cut them up and use them for rehab. Um, I use them to rehab these beavers. So, you know, um, you know, no one really wants fur anymore. And why else are they, they trapping? You know, it's, it's simply, 
You know, it's very separate from what municipalities do when they're trying to stop flooding of roadways. This is all recreational trapping. That's all done. You can buy a license and you can trap for sport. And that's all it is. So as I said, animals do suffer in traps. And this has been studied by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. This is the research arm for wildlife agencies in every state um, that conducted research on thousands of animals um, that were neck cropsies, neck cropsies were done on the carcasses of these animals that were caught in best management practice traps, the best traps uh, you can find. And they all had these injuries, bone and teeth fractures, amputation of digits, often self-inflicted, laceration of tissue, and so on and so on. Um, you know, even if there are no visible injuries, there's, there's physical damage because uh, as a, um, a uh, veterinarian who testified in Idaho with a, a thousand hours of experience in the field, you know, the trap, you know, uh, clamps down on a limb of the animal. It's constricting the blood flow of that limb. And after two or three hours, that causes, that releases toxins and causes long-term permanent damage and, and pain and eventually death. So even if the animal doesn't seem to be harmed, you can't really release that animal and expect it to survive in the wild. Um, so uh, I'll just go back and point, point this out here. Um, you know, he, in this article, they said, we acknowledge the issue of animal welfare is complex and involves physical injury and other considerations, but there's insufficient knowledge of technology to incorporate other metrics. In other words, they only measured physical damage. There, there was no measurement of psychological or um, non-physical suffering uh, in these traps. Uh, typically, beavers are trapped by conibear traps. These are body-crushing kill traps. Um, they uh, very often, though, the beavers are not trapped outright. Uh, it'll take them about 15, 20 minutes to die, as I said, because they can hold their breath underwater for 15 minutes. They also indiscriminate, like leg hole traps. You can have non-target animals caught in these traps. Um, these traps are indiscriminate, especially leg hole traps, because it's simply open. Anything can be caught in these traps. Um, so. Typically, the testimony has been that two non-target animals will be ca caught for every target animal. And some studies have found it's actually three to one, three non-target animals for every target animal. So that's, that's a, a big problem. You're, you know, you can't limit um, the animals you're trying to kill, uh, unlike hunting. Hunters often say you can't pull a trigger on a trap. You know, it's too indiscriminate. Um, and some trappers will say, well, you can adjust the tension on the pan, but this is, you know, this is really only, um, um, you know, will only help if the animal is of a, if the, the animals are of vastly different weights. Um, you know, in the study it said, trap, traps are best management tra practice traps are specific for fur bearers. We divided the total number of capture of fur bearers by the total number of captures of all species. In other words, what he's saying is that uh, these traps are selective for fur bearing mammals. That means, you know, they'll catch a mammal, but it can't be more specific than that. That's a very low bar, you know. Um, the alternative is that perhaps it's trapping mammals and not raptors, or it's trapping mammals and not humans, or it's trapping mammals but not pets. That's hardly specific or selective. Uh, it can't be selective within species or between species. You know, you can't distinguish between a bobcat and a lynx, and the lynx are an endangered species. You can't distinguish between a mink and a pine marten, which is pine marten is also endangered. 
So th this is a, a big problem in terms of wildlife management. It can't, it, it can't uh, distinguish between species. It certainly can't distinguish between sexes and ages within those species, uh, which is, you know, in hunting, you will have regulations about the number of points a buck has to have because they want older, more mature bucks. You simply can't do that with trapping. Is trapping well regulated? Well, I'd say not really. Um, you know, there's few restrictions on the type of traps used. You know, they will recommend using best management practice traps, but that's volunteer. They can basically use any kind of trap. Um, the only restriction is that the trap can't have jaws on it. Uh, there are no restrictions on how animals are to be killed, bludging, stomping, strangling, and so forth. No reporting of non-target animals. You have no idea other animals that are being trapped, including domestic uh, dogs and cats. No bag limits, no limits on how many animals you can trap, no limits on the age, size, sex of the animal's traps, no limit on the number of licenses license issued. Uh, the season is very long for trapping. It goes from October through March. That's half the year, you know, unlike hunting seasons. Uh, nuisance wildlife control officers are also not, uh, not regulated. <clears throat> Fish and Wildlife Department will say, well, we need trapping as a way to monitor or control populations. But trapping is dependent on uh, human factors, such as how active the trappers are, how intensely they trap. So it's a, it's a very imperfect measure of uh, monitoring population. The catch per unit effort can also be interpreted very differently um, in, uh, in monitoring populations. Um, Trying to use trapping to control populations, well, that's you know very controversial too. Uh, you can argue trapping is too indiscriminate to target specific members of a species, disrupts colony and pack hierarchies. This is true of beavers. When you when you trap a beaver, you're disrupting that family unit, and um, you might only cause dispersal of those beavers, which creates more potential conflicts. Uh, much recreational trapping takes place in underpopulated areas, such as wildlife management areas, where there's no conflicts at all with these beavers. Uh, some targeted species um, can respond well to trapping, others go into decline. Uh, in fact, sometimes the population will only increase as a result of trapping. Um, many, you know, trappers will justify this. Uh, trapping, though, by saying that, well, if you don't trap, then this will, this will result in, if trapping were to end, wildlife populations would increase. Wildlife damage would increase. Landowner tolerance for wildlife would decrease. Property values would fall. Uh, habitat would be lost because landowners would lose an incentive to maintain wildlife habitat. That's a scenario that if you end trapping, you're going to have beaver Armageddon. Beavers are going to populate out of control. And that was actually um, one uh, article cited, uh, a study in Massachusetts that, um, you know, apparently in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, they enacted a trapping ban by ballot initiative in 1996. And the claim here is that after that ballot initiative, beaver populations tripled in size over five years. That is an outright lie. And I'll show you why. This is a, a graph that was produced at every, every, um, uh, every presentation that was ever done by the fur bearer biologists at Fish and Wildlife on beavers. They always showed this graph. And this graph, if you look at the purple line, which says it's known population growth, it was very almost uh, flat up until the trapping ban went into effect in 1996. And then look what happened. What do you see happens with the graph? 
it explodes. Uh, allegedly, you have 50% population growth. <clears throat> well, look at this. At the bottom, can you see these light blue bars? Yeah. OK, this is the basis for this study, the, the number of pelts, beaver pelts, that were being trapped. So guess what happened after the ban in 1996? There are no more pelts. You went from 1,136 pelts year before the ban to 98. They could still trap with live traps, live capture traps. So you know, the, it was only a tenth of what it had been before. So then how are they getting this 50% increase? Plus, look at how, what percentage is of the trapped animals compared to the total population. The population of beavers is over 20,000. There's only a little over 1,000 beavers trapped. So if you took away, you know, if you, if you still had trapping, if you took away all those trapped animals, in other words, you know, that's 0.5% of the population. So that's how much you would expect an increase. They're saying it's 5-0, 50% increase. How is that mathematically possible? <laughs> this is very suspect because your evident evidentiary base, your evidence base, is gone after the ban. So how can you say there's this explosive growth? Can anyone explain that to me? Uh, I can't, and I asked Dave Waddles, who is the fur bearer biologist for Massachusetts, you know, getting this from the horse's mouth, so to speak. He said to me, <clears throat> harvest was greatly reduced after 1996. A valid question is how did that affect population estimate? Because they based that estimate on the harvest. Did low harvest numbers inflate the estimate, lower it, or doesn't that matter? I am not familiar enough with the inner workings of the model to even speculate. So in other words, I have no clue. They <laughs> have no clue what was going on. And yet, this is what was being shown to the public by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. In every presentation of beavers, look what's happening if you take away our trapping. You're going to have an explosion of beaver populations. Not true, no evidence. I'll show you what is true. This. This is the best study of beaver populations out there. This is a 50-year-long study of beavers at Quabbin Reservation in Massachusetts. Uh, and it was done by colony counts. This is the most accurate you can get, actually counting beavers on the ground. And what's happening here? Well, beaver population does grow when, as beavers expand into existing habitat. But then what happens? It reaches a peak and then declines and ends up almost where it started. There's a natural cycle here. Just like there's a natural cycle to every beaver site, beavers will use all the food in that site and reach the carrying capacity, and then will leave. And the site will grow back. There's a cycle. And that's what happens naturally. You don't need to trap beavers to control their populations. Beavers control their own population. And the cycle can, will go on ad infinitum, as shown at Sage Hen Creek in California, where you had a, a, an increase and then a decline, and then an increase and a decline. So you get the picture. So anyway, also in, in surveys of the public, uh, they found that um, you know, uh, the Vermont Department of Fish and, Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife conducted a survey in last year, in 2022, they found that 68% of Vermonters oppose recreational trapping. 62% oppose trapping for fur and clothing. So solid majorities oppose recreational trapping. Um, a study done by the EVM Center for Rural Studies in 2017 found that 75% of Vermonters want to ban trapping. Uh, this is true generally, too, in the Northeast region. Surveys have found that 79% oppose recreational trapping. In the country at large, that's 72%. Uh, majorities thought regulated trapping is OK, but only, quote, if the animals die quickly and without undue pain, or if animals accidentally caught can be released. 
Well, the problem is neither of those happens, <laughs> okay? You know, animals do suffer in these traps, and if they're caught in these traps, after two or three hours, you can't release them uh, without expecting them to survive because they suffer long-term damage. So um, that's the problem there. Um, fur, I'll just mention something about fur. Um, you know, this New York Times article from a couple days ago mentioned how fur sales in California are, are down and California has banned the sale of fur, but does anyone care? No one wants fur anymore. Um, and I've studied fur because I've studied fur on live beavers and as, as coats. And I can tell you, fur is meant to be on a living animal. The only way fur really functions is on a living animal. The fur will dry out because of the internal heat of the animal drying out the fur. If you get a fur coat wet, it'll take a very long time for it to dry. Also, if you get a fur coat dirty, you basically have to throw it out because there are barbs in the fur that hold on to that dirt and you'll never get it clean. The only way beavers clean themselves is by constantly grooming themselves. Fur was mainly a status symbol for Hollywood stars back in the day, for example, or was used as a punishment. You wear the fur inside out against your skin, it's very irritating. So it was used as a punishment in the church. Um, so I would argue trapping is counterproductive to good wildlife management, largely because it's indiscriminate impacts upon populations. It's un unreliable as a method of population control. Recreational trapping is controversial, not popular with the public. Uh, a lot of, large problem is it invites political considerations into policy decisions. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department is making policy decisions really because for political reasons it wants to promote trapping because it feels itself beholding, beholden to the trapping lobby. And that's pretty outdated because in the old days, Fish and Wildlife Department was financed by trapping fees. Nowadays, they're mainly financed by taxes from the general fund from people like you and me. So they really have to expand their outlook and um, you, know, the, you know, the reasons why people appreciate wildlife. And you know, 43% of respondents thought that it was influenced by politics. Uh, well, normally there is a season for, for trapping and it ends in March. Yeah, I mean, the reason for that is so that you're not orphaning beaver kits because um, the, the uh, mothers haven't give, given birth to the kits yet. So that's why it ends in March. You know, the beaver kit I got on June 1st was born pretty late in the season, um, but that was done by a landowner and there are no regulations in terms of landowners who can trap beavers, um, you know, if they're seen to be doing damage to the property. Anyway, uh, feel free to take this uh, sheet about Act, uh, about H191. This is an act introduced in the legislature in the House that would uh, end recreational trapping. And it gives a fact sheet of what it does and what it doesn't do. So feel free to take that. And there are 25 co-sponsors of that bill, which is very impressive. Uh, if you want to write to your legislator or local representative or senator, uh, ask them to support uh, this bill, that would be great. There's also an online petition. If you go to www.protectourwildlifevermont.org, there's a link to uh, signing that petition as well. Right, so I think that's all the time I have, right? Thank you. Yeah, thanks.